Hi everybody, today I have with you Ramesh Wadwani, who I've known in the Bay Area for a long time, but believe me, catching him is very difficult, so I'm really thrilled that we are able to host him uh, in India. Um, so Ramesh, I wanted to spend some time talking about your philosophy. You're doing lots of interesting things uh, in India. Uh, first, I wanted to go back your background a little bit. You're my, my senior IIT Bombay person. And I think the entrepreneurial bug bit you there when you started uh, a cafeteria for all the bad food there is. And then you went to Silicon Valley, started your company there. I want to start with the first company you started. It wasn't easy to get funding. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs feel, start a company, write a business plan, you know, valuation, money, and that's it. So tell me a little bit about your real entrepreneurial journey in the Bay Area and how many VCs did you have to go to? What was that journey like? Well, my entrepreneurial journey actually began in Pittsburgh uh, because I went to Carnegie Mellon University to get my master's and then I stayed, got my PhD. And then I decided to start my first company. And the first company was in security systems and energy management systems for commercial buildings. And uh, I was not a US citizen, so uh, I had a student visa which had just become a green card. Uh, since I had no track record as an entrepreneur, and it was 1972, the US was in the middle of a recession, um, I had to go to 125 venture capital firms. By the way, there were none in Pittsburgh. Yes. So all these firms were in New York and Boston and some on the West Coast. So 125 firms to get $150,000. It was incredibly painful, uh, expensive. I was staying in flea bag hotels because couldn't afford anything better. Uh, and yet it was the best learning that I've had in terms of raising capital. So I've, since then, I've always believed in capital efficiency, that you try and do a lot with a little, mm -hmm. uh, even if a lot more capital is being offered to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that's where my journey began. So how did you, you know, after the first 10, I can understand, after the 30th, how do you have the energy to go to the 31st? Because each one is technically a failure, right, when the person doesn't give you a check. So when you face that, how do you get yourself up the next day? I, th I think the single most important quality I think of a good entrepreneur is uh, being resilient and being tenacious. If you're not willing to be resilient and you're not willing to be tenacious, you could be very lucky, but the odds are going to be against you because there's only so many people who can attribute their success to luck. Uh, and I don't, I think that really in some sense comes from growing up in India because in India we have to go through so many challenges just in everyday living. So when you're in the US, that tenacity and that resilience in some sense comes naturally just based on our DNA and yeah. where we grew up. Uh, but uh, th that was the key. I, I refuse to give up. I refuse to you know, say no. And when I was rejected the 30th time, it actually made me want to prove them all wrong. So I went to the 31st, and then I went to the 100th, and then I went to the 124th, yeah. and then finally the 125th is where I lucked out. So obviously they got good returns. And uh, you know now you have dedicated a lot of your philanthropic energy to uh, spreading entrepreneurship. And you started this almost a decade ago in India. So tell me a little bit about your philosophy on this long journey. Um, what would you like to see in entrepreneurship in India? Well, um, it really starts with wanting to accelerate uh, the growth rate of emerging economies, right? We can, we can talk about why a growth rate is 5% or 7%, and certainly a lot of it has to do with government policy, there's no question about it. But beyond that, growth really comes through entrepreneurship. I mean, what are the fundamental drivers of growth? You've got to have a million entrepreneurs. Yes. How do you take a culture which 15 years ago when I started my foundation was really not that entrepreneurial. The culture in India was go get a government job or go get a job at Hindustan Lever. Um, and uh, I felt that the mission of our foundation should first of all be focused. Uh, it should be focused on something that would have large impact. It, would, it should be focused on something where substantial job creation would happen and economic growth would be accelerated. And I just felt entrepreneurship was exactly the right thing to do. Now, as it turns out, I've been a lifelong entrepreneur, so I also felt I had something 
personal to contribute in terms of my experience and my ability to help make this mission happen. So the foundation today, uh, the Badwani Foundation, uh, started the National Entrepreneurship Network 15 years ago. It's been growing since then. Uh, we teach entrepreneurship to 100,000 students every year. We've helped create, through the National Entrepreneurship Network, thousands of companies. In spite of that, I feel the journey is, uh, hasn't even reached the midpoint because till we get to a million entrepreneurs who are inspired by the kind of work we do, uh, we still have a long way to go. Now, uh, on the geographic dimension, uh, about three years ago, we began expanding into other countries. Right. So today we have the National Entrepreneurship Network actually operational in 20 countries. So uh, five countries in East Africa, three countries in South Africa, uh, five countries in Latin America, uh, five countries in Southeast Asia. Of course, India is still the hub. And by the end of this year, we are planning to expand into West Africa, North Africa, Egypt, uh, Brazil. So we should be at something like around 30 countries by the end of this year, spreading essentially the same message with the same playbook, the same curriculum that we have developed, the same technology platform that we've developed, the same methods and approaches that we've developed in India. And I think it's a great network of entrepreneurs. I think somebody living in India has a lot more in common with somebody in Africa or other parts of Asia than they would with say America or UK or so, and there aren't any networks connecting them. So it's really great. And you're expanding now into technology. I mean, uh, you have just announced something about uh, investing in AI. And I think like internet AI is going to be the base for a lot of things uh, that we do. So share with us a little bit of as a next step, why or a different step, what was it about AI that fascinated you? Uh, when I was at Carnegie Mellon, and this goes back to 1969, I graduated from IIT Bombay and went to Carnegie Mellon, as I said, got my master's and my PhD there. I actually had my first taste of what was then called AI. AI was an idea more than a technology. Back in 1969, 70, 71, I worked with some of the pioneers like uh, Herb Simon and Alan Noel. Um, and then I actually didn't do anything with it for about 10 years. Then when I was building my second company, American Robot, I felt perhaps it was time to use AI and we actually created one of the first vision systems, AI-enabled vision systems in the world back in the 1982-83 timeframe. Uh, the technology development was successful. Uh, the commercial potential was not because the cost of hardware, the cost of software, uh, the performance characteristics were just not ready yet. So we built it, tried it, shelved it as commercially unviable. All these years went by. And in these years, particularly after I started Symphony Technology Group 15 years ago, I look back and I've built 36 companies. Mm. Uh, and I would say 34 of them have been successful. Uh, three of them have been, or two of them have been mediocrities. So one could say, you know, sort of more on the unsuccessful side, not bankruptcies, not failures in that sense, but not really what you would call successes. Uh, and I kind of felt this passion to be at 50 companies as yes. a lifetime goal. <laughs> so that leaves a gap of 14 companies. So I started my new group only about a year ago called Symphony AI Group, and we will be building out a commercial for-profit uh, companies that are AI-enabled business-to-business platforms serving different vertical markets like healthcare or retail or consumer packaged goods, uh, oil, gas, chemicals, or horizontals like talent and the IT organization and so on. That journey is well underway. Uh, unlike the first company where I had to beg, borrow to get to 100, 125 VCs to get my first yeah. venture capital, here I'm funding the first $250 million with my own capital. Yes. So, yeah. you know, what a yeah. difference a few years make. Uh, and a lot of hard work in between. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of hard work in between. Uh, but, uh, so I want to build 15 companies of scale. I want to build a multi-billion dollar group. Don't know if it's possible or not, but it'll be completely AI-centered business platforms. Now, simultaneously, I feel that there are two ways to look at AI in terms of the impact on society. There's the dark view, which is that AI is going to take away a lot of white collar jobs, and to some degree that is actually true. 
But then there's the bright view, which is my view, which is that AI can be used to empower people who are less educated, less privileged, less skilled. And why not focus on that side of it? So on the philanthropic side of the equation, the newest initiative of uh, my foundation, the Vadwani Foundation, and my younger brother's foundation, my younger brother Sunil is also an entrepreneur. He built a very successful company, which he sold to Capgemini. Uh, he has a foundation called the Wish Foundation, which focuses on healthcare in India. So we decided to team up for the first time in our philanthropic efforts. And we've created the Vadwani Institute for Artificial Intelligence, philanthropic, nonprofit, focused on social good. And it's focused on solving uh, or using AI to help accelerate the quality of public health, help accelerate the quality of primary education, of skilling, agriculture, improving crop yields, and so on. Long list of topics that will massively improve society through the application of AI, and to me, that's the bright side of AI. How do we uh, empower tens or hundreds of millions of people through the application of AI? I have to so go both back. these journeys I'm, are yeah. going in parallel. Absolutely. I've got Symphony AI <laughs> going on the business side, nothing to do with the social side, and then we've got this Vadwani Institute for AI focused entirely on the social side, yes. essentially taking whatever I earn on the other side, cycling it back into philanthropic. So I have to process. ask you a very personal question. You know, both you talked about your brother. Both of you are incredibly successful. And we talked a little bit about when you were two, you had polio. And, uh, you know, in, especially in a place like India growing up, uh, everything is a huge issue. What did your parents do to make the two of you what you are? Because I think you, I mean, it's like unless you walk into the room, I forget half the time that you had polio. You never behave as though it's something that brings you down. And both of you have done extremely well. So something was in the way uh, it, the values you formed. So tell me a little bit about what, what was it that happened in your upbringing that made you both who you are? Uh, so I, I've given some thought to this. Obviously, you know, at my age, it's, time to, it, it's good to reflect, reflect from time to yes. time on yeah. why we are who we are. And I would say the first was unconditional love. Uh, now, that's not. Uh, just unique to our family. I would say it's true to virtually every Indian family and most families in other parts of the world as well. Uh, the second was a great belief in the power of education to be transformational. So in spite of my polio, which was at age two, uh, there was a belief among people in school uh, that maybe I should not be educated because my journey would be too hard. And I remember uh, I went to St. Columbus School in Delhi. We were living in Delhi at the time. I was uh, five years old when my father took me uh, into uh, the principal of St. Columbus. I couldn't walk because I hadn't had the surgeries yet that would allow me to be as mobile as I am today. And the principal said, we can't admit you because you will never be able to make it through school. My father had to literally beg him to give, him, uh, to give me a chance for one year. He said, give him one year at the end of the year you make the decision you feel is best for the school. And that was a turning point for me. It was actually a turning point for the principal of the school yeah. because he learned something, the power of strength, the power of tenacity. And uh, so I would say that's the third quality yeah. my parents had. They either had it before because they went through partition. Uh, we were in Karachi, we right. had to move to India. So I think their great strength came through the partition process. But then my journey was another time of great challenge for them because in some sense, it's easier for the kid who has polio than for the parents of the kid who has polio. Uh, and uh, that strength translated into shared strength that they shared with me, with my older brother and my younger brother, Sunil. So I think these were the three things. I mean, th there is no other magic thing yeah. that happened. It's not right. like my dad was never an entrepreneur. He worked for a bank. Yeah. My dad was, you know, having worked for a bank, it was good that he was not creative because you're not supposed to be creative when you work for a bank. <laughs> yeah. uh, but on the other hand, I turned out to be 
pretty creative, right? And when you look at all these companies. So we have to thank the tenacity and the bad food in IIT for you to become an entrepreneur. Uh, that certainly helped. Yeah. That certainly helped. The, the <laughs> Canteen Corporation of Hostel 2 yes. owes, yeah. owed its existence entirely to the absolutely lousy food we were getting in Hostel 2. <laughs> and so. that taste that gave you a taste of entrepreneurship, and that's the end of everything. Once you that, taste that entrepreneurship, once you taste it, you can't let you go. Can go. You back. can't let go. So I would ask you one other thing about you. Uh, you're a big Bollywood fan. You I watch, yes. you know, all the movies, etc. So if no, you no, no, so I want to correct you. Okay, fine. I read about the lives of Bollywood stars. <laughs> I don't actually yes. have a strong interest in watching Bollywood movies. So if you were to so, meet uh, somebody, who would you like to? I'm sure you met any, everybody you wanted to meet, but if you could meet, who would you like to meet? Uh, I would say Tabu. Ah, fantastic. Uh, and yeah. uh, and the reason is because I'm not impressed with you know sort of run of the mill actors who come and go, and there's obviously a giant mill, you know, sort of a Bollywood mill where actors come and go. I think she's withstood the test of time. A few of the uh, Indian movies that I actually like, you know, are movies that she's done. Uh, so, you know, I just have a lot of respect for what she's achieved. Great. So thank you so much for your time. I have one, only one last question. Uh, you said earlier that you're just starting, you're not done with your entrepreneurial journey. So you've had an, you, you're a personification of the American dream. I think someone coming from outside, being there, contributing to the system, become superbly successful. What's the kind of Indian dream you think uh, the Indian entrepreneurs should pursue now? Um, you would like to see happen here? Uh, I would like, first of all, a million more entrepreneurs in India than we have today. But that's just numbers. And then you come down to the individual story of each entrepreneur. I would like each of you to be relevant. And relevance can be achieved in so many different ways. It can be achieved by the nature of the business that you have. It can be achieved by the creativity that you demonstrate that inspires other people. It can be achieved by the financial success that you achieve so that other people want to emulate that. It can be achieved by the kind of talent you build so that when that talent gradually leaves you, each of them is an entrepreneur waiting to happen. It can be achieved by the number of jobs you create. It can be achieved by the intellectual property that you create because that intellectual property might translate into uh, you know, uh, other kinds of new ideas and new creations. So there's so many different ways to be relevant, but if you want to be a great entrepreneur, you've got to be relevant. Great. So. Thank you so much for your time, Ramesh. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.